Okay, great. Um, all right, I'm Rashmi. I am um, a graduate student in Tommy and Kilov's lab at uh, the University of Texas at Austin. Um, and uh, I'm going to start with the clinical motivation for this work today. Um, so neoadjuvant therapy is a standard of care for locally advanced breast cancer patients. Um, and uh, after neoadjuvant therapy, um, a patient will receive surgery. And at the time of surgery, a surgical biopsy will determine uh, whether or not they achieved pathological complete response. Um, this is a particularly important metric because it is associated with reduced risk of recurrence and um, uh, uh, mortality. Um, however, less than half of locally advanced breast cancer patients achieve PCR after completion of neoadjuvant therapy, um, which is why we're interested in this problem, um, where we want to accurately predict treatment response um, so that we can eventually optimize neoadjuvant uh, therapeutic regimen. So the overall goal of this work specifically is to accurately predict this response to neoadjuvant therapy. I'm sorry, Rush, Rush, I'm so yes. sorry to interrupt you, but we had a question from the audience, if you could please define neoadjuvant therapy. Yes, absolutely. Um, the device audience here. In this case, let me see if I can see the comments as well. Um, it's, it's therapy before surgery, um, whereas adjuvant therapy is, is therapy after surgery. Um, so in this case, uh, patients are receiving chemotherapy. Okay. Um, so here, here we're trying to predict response for ISPI2 patients, um, which is patients from a specific clinical trial that was a multi-site trial, pretty uh, heterogeneous. So we want to show that this mathematical model is generalizable. Um, and could potentially be used in the clinical setting. Um, and we are using quantitative MRI data to calibrate our model. Uh, so we hypothesized that our model would be able to predict both the change in tumor volume and cellularity with an accuracy that was statistically equivalent to what we observed for the same model in a previous data set, um, which is just a single site data set um, and had only one breast cancer subtype, which I'll discuss the breast cancer subtypes shortly. So starting off with our data set and framework, um, I, I mentioned the ISPI2 clinical trial. It's for patients with locally advanced breast cancer. Um, and some particular points to note about this uh, clinical trial is that uh, patients Receive treatment and imaging at any one of 10 different clinical sites. Um, all of the imaging was standard of care. So we had dynamic contrast enhanced MRI and uh, diffusion weighted MRI. And then patients underwent either standard of care or an experimental therapeutic regimen. Um, so this is what our cohort looks like. We have 91 patients total. Um, so looking at the disease subtypes here, we broke the, the cohort uh, into three different disease subtypes um, based on whether patients had um, a, a higher level of um, receptors. So either the HER2 positive, uh, sorry, the HER2 receptor or hormone receptors, in this case, estrogen and progesterone. Um, so for triple negative patients, they did not have an increased level of any of those uh, receptors. Then we have the HER2 negative, but um, HR positive case. Um, and finally, the HER2 positive case. Um, and for each of these subtypes, the patient could have received an experimental therapy or the standard of care, which standard of care was just paclitaxel, um, uh, except for the HER2 positive patients as paclitaxel plus these monoclonal antibodies. So that's pertuzumab and trastuzumab. Um, and then we did have more non-PCR than PCR patients, uh, but we had some of, of each case in uh, all of our different categories. Um, so patients received uh, imaging at visit one before starting any therapy. 
um, as you can see right here. And uh, then they received three cycles. So this is three weeks of treatment. Uh, that's either paclitaxel or an experimental therapy. Um, they received the same imaging at visit two. And then after nine weeks, so that's completing this first treatment course, um, they received imaging again at visit three. And that's the, the data that we're going to use to um, calibrate our data. So we're using visit one and visit two to calibrate. And then we are using visit three as a ground truth to see how accurate our predictions are. Um, and then patients did receive a, a second treatment course. So that's 12 more weeks um, before surgery. Uh, we didn't run the model all the way out to the time of surgery, but we did use our model predictions at visit three to see how well we can predict PCR status at time of surgery. So the first step of um, this, this framework is to first do the image processing. Um, so like I mentioned, we have two different types of raw MRI data. We have our diffusion weighted data at four different um, B values. This corresponds to four different um, gradient strengths of B0 uh, to 800. And then we have our dynamic contrast enhanced MRI. So we have one pre-contrast scan and then um, between five to eight post-contrast scans. And those are spaced 90 seconds apart. Um, the first image processing step is to do this intervisit registration. So we are uh, aligning the diffusion weighted data to the DC data at each visit using information provided in the DICOM header. Um, and then we do a rigid registration, which you can see at the bottom here um, to fully align the um, breast and the tumor regions. So once we've done all of our intervisit registration, we also need to do an intervisit registration. So to align the um, breast contour between visits. In this case, what we're doing is we're registering visit one and visit three to visit two. Um, so this registration is a deformal registration, but we put a rigid penalty on the tumor RRI um, so that we aren't biasing the results of our um, eventual model with the registration. We know that any changes in the tumor, um, in, in the tumor shape and size um, are, are true changes, not those caused by registration. Uh, so you can see for this particular patient, if you look at the 3D rendering here that the tumors are not aligned at all um, before registration and then after registration, both the breast contour and the tumors are aligned um, much better. So then the last step is this parametric mapping. Um, we use a k-means clustering to segment our different tissue types. So we have our um, tumor here in white, the fibroglandular tissue, and then the fatty adipose tissue. Um, and within the tumor region, we get a map of the cell number um, from the diffusion weighted MRI data. So we can um, use that diffusion weighted MRI data to get an apparent diffusion coefficient map. And then uh, from the apparent diffusion coefficient map, we can then calculate the cell number. All right, so moving on to the mathematical model itself. Um, our model is a partial differential reaction diffusion equation. We are computing the change in the number of tumor cells in space and time. Um, and that is a function of cell diffusion, um, cell proliferation, which this is logistic growth, and then response to therapy. So um, cells die due to treatment here. Uh, our diffusion term is coupled to the surrounding tissue, um, so the uh, mechanics of the tissue pressing back on the on the tumor are considered um, and kind of impede the outward growth. Uh, the parameters that we're calibrating here are a local proliferation rate, so that's um, the proliferation rate at each voxel, and we get a map for that parameter and then a global drug efficacy rate where we just have one um, value there. 
our assigned parameters, so um, based on the results of sensitivity analysis, our diffusion coefficient without stress was um, not a sensitive parameter, so we just went ahead and assigned that uh, from a literature value. The carrying capacity is the physical carrying capacity calculated based on the voxel size and the cell volume. Um, and then we model with a range of decay uh, values from 0.05 inverse days to 1.5 so that we can quantify the uncertainty of our model. Um, the mechanical co coupling coefficient is another literature value. And then we have our remaining variables. Um, so the important model inputs here, we have our initial drug distribution. We are assuming that the drug distribution um, is proportional to the DC signal intensity, um, which is a bit of a simplifying assumption. Uh, our tissue segmentation map that I mentioned before defines the modeling domain. Um, and then we have our visit one cell map as our initial condition, and our visit two cell map is what we are going to calibrate to. Um, the calibration itself is a levenberg marquardt nonlinear least squares optimization. Um, and what we get from that calibration is, um, this is an example for one particular patient. We have a uh, value for alpha, our global parameter, and then a map for um, K proliferation, which is a local parameter. Okay, so I'll go ahead and show some results of our modeling. Um, first for two representative patients um, and then for the entire cohort. Um, so these patients had uh, median accuracies. So about half of, of the patients um, had better results in these patients, half had uh, worse results. Um, so these are uh, good ones to look at. Um, on the in the top panel is a patient that had residual disease um, at the time of surgery, so non PCR patient, and then a PCR patient is on the bottom. Um, I, I will note that this is only out to visit three, not time of surgery. So even the PCR patient does still have some residual disease at visit three. But based on the surgical biopsy, we know that at the time of surgery, the patient did not have residual disease. Um, so here we're looking at time courses of the total tumor cellularity um, on top and then total tumor volume on the bottom um, for each of these patients. So the red circles are um, our observed data and then the um, blue line is what our model predicted using that median decay value um, and the range here is uh, given by all um, five of the decay values. Um, so in both cases, we can see that our calibration was, was definitely successful and accurate. Um, if you look at visit two, um, you can see that the observed model line up well. And then for these patients, um, the uh, observed data does lie within the range of the model prediction, um, though you can kind of see that the total cellularity is um, typically more accurate than the uh, tumor volume prediction. Uh, we can also look at this um, as the, the cell map prediction. These are for a center, central tumor slice for each patient. Um, you can clearly see here that the calibration was successful. And then the prediction um, results uh, are generally, so, so the total tumor cellularity is predicted well, um, but the model does slightly overestimate the volume um, and underestimate estimate the cellularity. So um, in the observed data, there's some sort of kind of tissue compression where you have um, a higher cell density, but smaller volume at visit three, and the model isn't quite capturing that, which I'll discuss a little bit more later. Um, and this is a, a similar 3D visualization where you can see that uh, the blue modeled volume is slightly larger for both of these patients at visit three, um, but it is predicting the general correct location. Uh, so for the entire cohort, um, here we're looking at the change from visit one to visit three and the total tumor cellularity for the 
the model data against the observed data on the left. And then this is the same metric with the volume instead of the cellularity. Um, the uh, points here are for that median decay value again, and then the error bars are the whole, the range of decay values. Um, and this is broken up into those three breast cancer subtypes. Um, so we are getting fairly high correlation coefficients of 0.94 for cellularity and 0.9 um, for tumor volume. Um, and these are similar to what we've seen before in, in a previous study with only triple negative breast cancer patients, um, we had correlation coefficients of 0.94 and 0.95. Uh, we also wanted to look at a local metric as well as this global metric. So um, this metric here, we're looking at the absolute percent difference in the between the observed and model tumor cell distribution. So this is the percent difference um, between the uh, observed and model change uh, for each voxel. And we're showing here the median in the interquartile range um, for the all the voxels in a particular patient's tumor. Um, so ideally, we'd want the median and the interquartile range to all be at zero, as you can see for some of these patients. Um, we also have patients where the local accuracy was um, much, much lower, where you have, for example, this, this patient where the percent difference is around 80% with a large error. Um, but 80% uh, of our patients did have um, a an absolute percent difference here lower than um, 10%. So overall, the uh, the local predict local prediction accuracy was fairly good. Um, that could use some improvements. And then the um, last part of the results is using that visit three data to predict PCR status at the time of surgery. So what we did here is we're looking at um, metrics with the observed cellularity and observed volume as kind of an upper limit for how well our model could potentially do. Um, and then we have uh, below those what using, using our actual visit three model predictions. Um, so you can see that the area under the receiver operator characteristic curve um, gets really close to, to our um, theoretical upper limit right here, so where we have a 0.77 value with our model. 0.79 observed, and then 0.78 modeled and 0.79. Uh, so this is for the entire cohort. Um, for HER2 positive patients, uh, the, the, the performance uh, for the prediction was worse. The HR positive HER2 negative patients, um, this prediction was better. Uh, and then triple negative patients were somewhere in the middle. All right. Uh, so a couple of limitations of our model. Um, I mentioned that tissue compression before. So what's going on here is that the, the model is capturing the total tumor cellularity, but seems to overestimate tumor volume and underestimate tumor, um, the, the local cellularity of visit 3 um, And this happens with, to some degree, um, for about half of our patients. So it is something that we would want to figure out how to address in the future. Um, uh, another limitation for a handful of patients with, uh, uh, so there were four patients in the cohort that had irregular treatment schedules. Here you can see that this patient, um, the last um, five treatments were, were spaced uh, further apart, um, and that's giving time for this, this regrowth. So because the spacing from visit one to visit two is very different from the spacing between visit two and visit three. The model isn't quite capturing those dynamics and is um, overestimating the visit three cellularity. Um, and then another, another limitation we found was for patients with really minimal or no change from visit one to visit three, um, it is difficult for the model to capture that lack of dynamics. Um, and instead, what, what it does is uh, really drives up both the proliferation and the efficacy rate. Um, so you have this increase from visit one to the first treatment, um, and then 
a decrease that that leads to an eventual underestimation of cellularity and volume. Uh, and then future directions for this work um, would be to apply the framework to optimize chemotherapy interventions. So we can model a range of possible treatment schedules. Um, and then the, uh, the, the predictions of which treatment schedules are the best could then be used to guide treatment planning. And we're also looking to extend this model to other solid tumor malignancies. So um, in particular, we've just begun working with a cervical cancer data set. Uh, that includes both MRI and FDG PET imaging. So in summary, our overall goal was to apply our biology-based mathematical model to the ISFI2 breast cancer patients and predict response to new adjuvant therapy. Um, and our results suggest that we uh, were able to use this tumor forecasting pipeline to make accurate predictions using uh, standard of care MRI data in the multi-site clinical trial setting. Um, so I'll end by thanking um, my lab members and other collaborators, and thank you all for your time.